Yeah, hi everyone, it's James Tennant here. So, today's video I thought I'd do a little bit about how to use iParts in Vault. Uh, there has been a little bit of confusion about how iParts work, so I thought I'd just go over it um, in a fair bit of detail about, well, firstly, what an iPart factory is, what the output of a factory looks like, and why I'm unable to do a copy design through Vault, uh, and why Vault you don't need to do a copy design through Vault. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll uh, start from scratch in Inventor starting with a brand new part. This new part that I'm going to create here is going to be my eye part but essentially I'm going to start off by just making it into an ordinary part. So I'll make the diameter of this, in this case it's just going to be a shaft um, and can't spell today just call it length equals 100. We'll accept that as a parameter. And uh, and you can see I've got a shaft there now. I'm just going to make sure I've got those parameters correct, um, just because I want to make it easy to understand. So I've got a diameter value there of 40, and I've got a length value there of 100. Before I do anything more, I'll give it a color so it's recognizable. Uh, and I'll save that straight up. So I'm going to put that into my vault. And I'm going to save it under, let's make a folder here called, um, well, I've got a couple of iPart ones there, but let's call it training iPart. And I don't like the big eye there. Let's get rid of that. Okay, so I'm saving a brand new part at this stage. It's, let's cut out the A13 and just call it 10.245 and save it into the iPart the training iPart area. I've also got a rule that uh, that pops up and requires me to fill in some properties um, on this part before I save it, which is okay. I'm just going to go and fill them in with um, blank values, really, uh, just so I can show the example. Okay, so currently what we're looking at here is an ordinary part. There's nothing special about it aside from a couple of named parameters. Um, what I want to do now is I want to turn this into an iPart. To do that, I need to jump over and convert it to iPart. I'm going to go and create a couple of rows in my iPart. And I'm going to label the diameter here as the first iteration is going to be 30, second is going to be 40, and the, the last one is going to be 50. Okay. Now, just to go over, before I go any further, just to go over the way iParts work. What I'm doing here is I'm not creating all these ones straight away. I'm actually creating a factory. And I'm telling the factory here is the products that you're allowed to produce. Member 1, Member 2, and Member 3. For clarity, I'm just going to rename these members to being something more recognizable. In this case, uh, 30 by 100. Uh, Vault is now... Oh, Inventor, sorry, is now just telling me that uh, that member is going to take on that file name when I insert it, which is exactly what I want. By 100. And finally, 50 by 100. I'm not going to worry about the part number. Okay, so again, what I'm doing is I'm telling the factory, here is the products you're allowed to produce. You're allowed to produce a 30 by 100, a 40 by 100, and a 50 by 100. So again, this is an iPart factory we're, we're producing here, not the iParts themselves. As you can see from my list now, my icon slightly changes, and I've now got this table in my list here with all the different member sizes available. So basically, if I hit the Save button now, this will have now saved a version of this file into my workspace. Um, let's go and look at training iPart, and you can see the 10.245 in there. This is, again, just to be clear, this is the iPart factory, not the iParts. I'm going to go and check that into Vault. And when that accepts. Okay, so now we want to use this iPart. We want to use a version of this iPart in an assembly. So let's close it down and let's go and cre create a new assembly. I'm going to do this by just placing in that iPart 
And I'm going to pause just before I go ahead and do this to show you what I'm talking about. So, as you can see, I've gone into the place component area and I want to go and place in the iPart factory. Now, as you can see, the 10245 was the iPart factory that we want to insert. When we go and insert that one, Inventor comes to us and says, okay, well, what version of the product you want. So that factory is now kicking into gear. It's about to produce a member. Inventor just wants to know what member to produce, whether it's a 30 or a 40 or a 50. Let's choose 30 and go OK. Let's dismiss that dialog box. And you can now see in my history browser here, I've now got a part in here called 30 by 100. Notice it's not 10, 2, 5. 4, 5. It's 30 by 100. The factory has gone and produced the 30 by 100 member. Okay? And if I look in my local workspace, I'll notice that I've now got a subfolder with the same name as the factory. So here is the factory. Here is the subfolder. They both have the same name. When I look under the subfolder, I'll see that I've now got and a part sitting in there that has been the product of the factory. So the factory has outputted a part for my assembly here. It's gone and made this part and it's placed this part into the assembly. So even though we picked on the factory to insert the factory, we didn't actually insert the factory. We inserted one of the products or one of the outputs from the factory, uh, which is a really cool way of looking at things, but it's very confusing at times if you don't understand the process. So again, the factory just produces or outputs one of those members, saves it, and inserts that member into your assembly. Let's go ahead and place in another component, just for the fun of it. Uh, let's place in this guy, and I'm going to go and constrain him to the edge. Now, as you can see, currently I'm in a bit of a position where I can't well, the, the shaft doesn't fit onto the part. So if I wanted to change the eye part to suit my hub here, I need to go into the eye part and change the component. Uh, again, I'm just going, I know I'm sounding like a broken record here, but I'm just going to go over it again. When I go into the, I beg your pardon, not eye part example, training eye part. As you can see, my factory has not been used in this assembly. However, this part here has. So, when I go ahead and change component on this, I go and pick, let's say, 40 to suit the diameter of that. Go OK. You can now see, and I want you to focus on the browser, the browser now says 40 by 100. It doesn't say 30 by 100, so we haven't changed the parameters of the 30 by 100 part. We've actually replaced the 30 by 100 part with a 40 by 100 part. And that was, again, just kicked that factory back into gear, said, OK, I need you to output a different version of you of yourself. Um, and it's gone ahead and outputted the 40 by 100 version. And I can see that in my local workspace now. I now have a 40 by 100 part sitting in my, um, in my factory subfolder. Let me go ahead and check this in. I'm just going to name it and go ahead and place it just into my local workspace, which is fine, uh, and go OK. Again, I'm required to fill in some information here. Uh, OK, it's checked in, so that's cool. OK. As you can see, I've now got it all checked in, which is looking good. In my history browser along the left hand side, I've got my assembly at the top level, which is using this part here, which is the iPart output from this factory. This is the factory. This is the part that's actually placed into the assembly. This part here is just referenced into this part. And this is an ordinary part. So now that I've got that in Vault, let's go ahead and close that down and go ahead and find that in my Vault. Here is, my here is my assembly 
that I've got in Vault. And you can see I've got a part checked into Vault there as well. This assembly is using the 40 by 100 version of the iPart and an ordinary component down the bottom here. This here is just referenced into this version of the iPart. So when we go and copy design, we can't copy design on this one because it's actually really not affecting this one. We could copy design this one and make changes manually if we wanted to. But this is the factory. It actually is not used in this assembly. It's just used in this part. So let's go and have a look at that. When we go to copy design, we can go ahead and copy this shaft if we want. So for example, this might be the case where we might want to hollow out the shaft. And in the original assembly, we wanted it as a solid shaft. In this version of the assembly, we want a hollow shaft, for example. If that's what we want to do, then we'd need to copy it. But notice I can't copy the factory because the factory is not used in this assembly. There's no point in copying the factory if it's not used in the assembly. And that is certainly the case. And finally, we're able to go and copy normal parts as well. So, I've got an assembly here. And what I want to do now is I might want to expand the diameter of this particular component. So uh, this hub here, I might want to give it a bit of bigger diameter. So I'm going to in increase the diameter to 50, for example, which will mean I'll need to also update the diameter of the shaft. Uh, I don't want it to affect my original assembly, so I'm going to go ahead and copy design on this. I don't need to copy anything else, actually. I only need to copy the assembly and this part that I want to change. This I part here I don't need to copy because I'm just going to go and replace the component just like I did before. I'm going to allow it to copy to the same folder structure and in the interest of clarity the new name is going to be I part as E and the new name for this one is uh, new hub or whatever it's going to be let's call this one new as well. These are all descriptions, they're really bad numbering schemes, but I hope they'll give, uh, put across the point. So as you can see from the list there, I've got those ones there. Let's go ahead and rename them, or copy them I should say. And you can now see I've got a new assembly called new iPart assembly. And you can see it's exactly the same as the original one. And I've also got, sitting under my designs folder, a new hub as well, which is being used in that assembly. So when I go and click on that guy, I have a look at the uses, and you can see it's using new hub, and it's using uh, the new assembly. Let's go ahead and make a modification to that assembly. So I know I'm using the new hub now, so let's go and change the new hub so that it's the right size. And I'm going to do that just by quickly just expanding that inside diameter to 50. You can see my model changes. Let's save that and check it back into Vault. Obviously, as I do this, you'll uh, expect that the assembly will update, which is what it has. And now this iPart in here is incorrect. So I don't need to copy design on the iPart, as I said before, I just need to change component. And I go and choose the component with the larger diameter. And again, that's just replacing the 40 by 100 iteration of the factory to the 50 by 100 iteration of the factory. We've now got a complete assembly where I can go and check that back in and go OK. Again, I'm required to put in some information here. Okay, so now let's have one last look at what we've done in our assemblies now. We've got the new assembly, which is using the 50 by 100 I part, and the old assembly, which is using the 40 by 100 I part. The new assembly is using the new hub, the old assembly is using the old hub. So that's how your I parts work, and I hope that was um, informative. Uh, please let me know if there's any questions, but I hope that's uh, a pretty good overview of the way an iPod works. Thanks very much for watching.